What do we do when the service we receive isn't what we expected? When it falls short of our hopes or even disappoints us? Maybe a waitress gets our order wrong. Maybe we're left waiting far longer than we planned. Or maybe things just don't turn out the way we imagined. In these moments, do we reject the one who didn't meet our expectations? Or are we able to extend grace, compassion and kindness? Jesus taught us to serve with love, but he also taught us how to receive with humility. He showed us that true grace isn't just about giving. It's about how we respond when things don't go our way. Jesus never promised to deliver us from difficulty, but that he would be with us through the storms. How do we receive the service and sacrifice Jesus has offered to us? A service that surpasses all expectations, even when we don't fully understand it. How will you respond to servant Jesus? What do we do when the service we receive isn't what we expected? When it falls short of our hopes or even disappoints us? Maybe a waitress gets our order wrong. Maybe we're left waiting far longer than we planned. Or maybe things just don't turn out the way we imagined. In these moments, do we reject the one who didn't meet our expectations? Or are we able to extend grace, compassion and kindness? Jesus taught us to serve with love, but he also taught us how to receive with humility. He showed us that true grace isn't just about giving. It's about how we respond when things don't go our way. Jesus never promised to deliver us from difficulty but that he would be with us through the storms. How do we receive the service and sacrifice Jesus has offered to us? A service that surpasses all expectations, even when we don't fully understand it. How will you respond to servant Jesus? I was just trying to help. I thought I could fix it. And my name's Ron. I am grateful to be here and to serve as your campus pastor here in Green. And we just want to welcome those that are joining us online. We're excited you're here with us this morning. When I was a kid, I loved to take things apart. I wanted to know how they worked. I wanted to know how to fix them and how to figure them out. So I would take things apart and sometimes they went back together. Sometimes they even worked again. And, and so one day I had, I, had, uh, I had heard my mom and dad talking. They were talking about uh, our rototiller. And it was in the, in the garden and it would not move forward. It was stuck, it would not engage. And they had been talking about that. Someone would need to fix it. That would need to be taken care of. My dad was away on a trip. So I woke up that morning and I looked out over a bright new day surveying the yard. And as I looked through the yard, I just, my eyes got connected to that rototiller. And try as I might, as I continued to look around, I could not get away from looking at the rototiller. It was not like a, a, ma a, a piece of metal stuck to a large magnet. And I just kept coming back, thinking about it, staring at it, looking. I could not get it out of my mind. And so I decided, well, I can help. I can fix it. Before I knew it, my tool set was out. My sockets were out. My wrenches were there. All just all of a sudden. And they were crying out to me. Take, take that nut off. Pull the, pull the bolt out. And before I knew it, 
Nuts were coming off, bolts were coming out, screws were coming off, sheet metal parts were being taken apart. And all of a sudden, by lunchtime, we didn't have a rototiller anymore. It wasn't a machine, it was a, a pile of oddly shaped parts with a motor. And as I, as I looked at that transmission, why wouldn't it engage? It looks so simple on the outside, so, so small, so simple. But when you opened it up, it wasn't simple. All the gears and the shafts and everything needed, put, it was like an enormous puzzle. And try as I might, rearrange things as I might, I could not get them back together again and get the, the, get the transmission to engage. It still wouldn't move. And I was frustrated. I was just sitting there in the middle of the garden with all these parts around me when I heard the car drive in the driveway and my father turned off the engine, he gets out of the car, the door shuts and I'm hearing that, I'm hearing the footsteps, boom, boom. And he got to find his son, his little boy, covered in grease, sitting in the pile of parts, sad pile of parts, <laughs> that did not work. And I looked up at my dad. I, I just wanted to help. I thought I could fix it. I, I thought I could help. I was sure that I could help. Unfortunately, my help was less effective than my mind thought it could be. Sometimes, don't we know who to ask or when we should ask? And yet we do it ourselves. DIY. Do it yourself. What could go wrong? And maybe there's a lot of different reasons we do that. Uh, maybe, maybe we are we're just unsure of our own limitations. I've got this. I can do it. I can figure it out. Maybe we're just very adventuresome sometimes and we want to tackle something new. We want to figure something new out. Uh, maybe, maybe at times we have something to prove. Maybe at other times, uh, we're, we're just, we've watched it on YouTube. We've seen someone else do it. It doesn't look too bad. It doesn't look too hard. We can tackle that, right? And then we get into it, and it maybe isn't quite as simple as we thought. One day, one day while Jesus was away, his disciples got into a situation that they tried to fix. They wanted to do it themselves. They didn't ask for help. In fact, they probably didn't even realize that they didn't understand how to fix it. But Jesus shares with them a lesson that we can learn from today. And so we're going to jump into to Mark chapter 9. If you join with me, tap or, or turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. I'll be on page 810 in the chair Bible. If you need a Bible, there is one right in your row. And we'd love you to have that as our gift uh, our investment in your faith journey. So in Mark chapter 9, jump into verse 14. It says this, when they returned to the other disciples. So who returned? What did they return from? Where were they? So at the beginning of Mark chapter 9, let me just give you some context coming into this. Jesus taps Peter, James, and John on the shoulder, and, and he says, come with me. And these close friends together climbed a mountain. They're climbing with their mentor up high, and when they finally reach the top, they're looking out, and they can see the grandeur all around, all, all around them. It was at the top where the real story takes place. Without warning, Jesus' appearance begins to change. He took on a transformation. He glowed. His clothes became dazzling white, as if that wasn't enough. Elijah and Moses appear, and they're there with them. Peter, James, and John were getting a glimpse of what Jesus would be like in heaven. It must have been amazing. And that day, Peter didn't want to leave. He just wanted to stay there and continue to soak it up. But, it, but as quickly as as Moses and Elijah had come, they were, they were gone. Jesus' mission was not over. And he led them down that mountain. 
and back to the crowds. And so in verse 14, when they returned to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd surrounding them and some religious, the teachers of religious law were arguing with them. That was a very new thing. Uh, the crowd saw Jesus. They were overwhelmed with awe. There was the teacher they had heard about. Maybe there's some residual effects of, of his glow on the mountain. But they are overcome with awe. And they flock to him. They run to him. And they run to greet him. And so there's this argument going on and the crowd immediately turns and they head to Jesus as he approaches. He and his three climbing companions enter into this crowd with the commotion ahead and and the crowd just kind of envelops Jesus. Verse 16, what is all this arguing about? And Jesus asked very directly. One of the men from the crowd spoke up and said, teacher, I brought my son so that you could heal him. He is possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. And whenever the spirit seizes him, it throws him violently to the ground. He foams at the mouth. He grinds his teeth. He becomes rigid. And and so I ask your disciples to, to cast out the evil spirit. But they couldn't do it. Maybe this evil spirit description sounds a little bit odd and, and unusual in our time. And Mark's describing the effect of an evil spirit, a demon, living in this boy. And so we hear that, and maybe at first we think of like the exorcist. I think these type of situations in our time come into our horror films, our, our drama. In our modern culture, Satan is more subtle in America. Often we don't see the, the spiritual battle so clearly for what it is. But in some other countries, demon possession is still recognized for what it is. Spiritual battles are very real. And Jesus was God on earth in flesh. And so spiritual battles surrounded him. Anywhere God is at work, including around us, expect Satan and his forces to attack. Expect it. When God is at work, he doesn't want God to succeed, right? Sometimes it's subtle, sometimes it's direct. While Jesus was on that mountain, his disciples stepped up to help. And so this father, he was desperate. He was desperate. Imagine, put yourself into his situation. Think about it from the point of view of the father. He's working a long day and he comes home. He's looking forward to see his family, to share a meal together. And as you're in his perspective, you step into the house and you go to give your your boy a hug. But suddenly, he's thrown violently to the ground. He seems to have no control over his body. He's racked with pain. His joints hurt. They begin to go stiff. They're locked tight. He foams at the mouth like a rabid dog. He falls to the floor stiff. Your heart breaks. Every day, you begin to search for a new doctor, maybe a new religious leader, someone who might be able to help, some type of help, some type of relief, someone, anyone. But nothing works. And you become more and more and more desperate. The disciples were this father's last hope. He's heard about Jesus. He gets there to see Jesus and the disciples are there and He's heard maybe his neighbors talking about them. They've traveled with Jesus. They've, they've gone out on their own mission. They've, they've been casting out demons. They, they've been healing. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, they could help. So he brings his son, and as he gets closer, 
Maybe he starts to doubt a little bit more. But what if maybe I've done this over and over and over again, but nobody can help. Maybe, maybe this time. And the disciples want to help. They've seen Jesus do this before, many times before. They've cast out a few demons on their own. I think they're thinking, we know how to do this. We've got this. We can do it. We can help. And so they try it out. They say the right words, the things they've heard Jesus say. They, they do the right action. They've seen what he's done before. And then the questions start to fly. And nothing happens. And before they know it, they're in the middle of a full-out argument, surrounded by a crowd of onlookers, and then Jesus steps in. Verse 19, Jesus said to them, you faithless people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? You could see the frustration on his face. You could hear it in his voice. But Jesus chose to help. He chose to help this father and this boy. And so he says, bring the boy to me. So they brought the boy. But when the evil spirit saw Jesus, it threw the child into a violent convulsion. He fell on the ground, writhing and foaming at the mouth. The evil spirit erased all doubt as to the depth of this problem. It was clear. Everyone there knew exactly what was going on. This boy was not okay. He desperately needed help. And Jesus' frustration melts right into compassion. He says, how long has this been happening? And Jesus asked the boy's father, and he replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire. It's trying to kill him. And this isn't about health. It's, it's not about quality of life. This isn't a disease or a disability. Instead, this is about life and death to the father. Life and death. The father pleads for his son. Have mercy on us. Help us if you can. I think Jesus responds compassionately. What do you mean, if I can? Anything is possible if a person believes. This father has tried to get help. He sought out every help he could possibly think of. And all hope seems gone. If anyone had reason to doubt, he, he has reason to doubt. He's even gone to the disciples and, and they failed. He couldn't get any relief. In verse 24, the, the father cries out instantly and he says, I do believe, but help my unbelief. I'm humbled by that confession. It's my confession. Instantly he says, I believe, I believe. But he's also honest. Help my unbelief. As if he's saying, I still believe even though I feel like I'm grasping at straws. Make up for where my belief falls short. Verse 25. When Jesus saw that the crowd of onlookers was growing, he rebuked the evil spirit. In a way, let's not make this any bigger than it already has grown. Let me deal with the issue. So he rebukes the evil spirit. Listen, you spirit, that makes this boy unable to hear and speak. I command you to come out of this child and to never enter him again. And then the spirit screamed and threw the boy into another violent convulsion and left him. And the boy appeared to be dead. 
That's what the, the Spirit's been trying to do for years. A murmur runs through the crowd. And the people say, he's, he's dead. Imagine what the Father's thinking. But Jesus took him by the hand and helped him to his feet, and he stood up. For the first time in year, this, years, this boy has been able to freely stand up on his own to take a breath, a deep breath, to, to think without another power in his mind. He can move on his own. I'm, I'm sure he, he just ran to his father with his wide, arms wide open and gave him a huge hug. And all the while, the disciples are looking on. And they're, they're staring at each other and they're thinking, what happened? That's what we did. What's going on? They got questions in their eyes and, and finally the crowd disperses and they have their chance. Check out, check out what's next. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out the evil spirit? And Jesus replied, this kind can be cast out only by prayer. And I think the disciples are they're thinking about that. But hey, we, we did everything right. We did the same thing you did. We didn't even hear you say a prayer. I'm sure the disciples followed his example. They probably said all the words that they had heard him use before. They, they probably used the same procedure that they thought that he used. The things that they had seen, maybe what they had done when they were on that mission as, as disciples sent out two by two, and they did the same thing this time. They were saying the right things. They were doing the right things, but they weren't relying on God's power. That's what's missing. And so Jesus gives them an answer here, doesn't he? And his answer is prayer. You see, when I serve on my own, I miss out on God's power. I get to use my own strength, but I miss out on what God can do. Jesus was able to cast out this spirit to serve this man's need in the power of God. The battle wasn't won with human strength. It wasn't won with verbal formula or religious, uh, religious ritual. It's not how this happened. And I can just hear the disciples continuing to murmur, but you didn't even pray. There's not, a, there's not a prayer here. That's true, but Jesus relied on the power of God, the Spirit of God, God the Father, and on earth, that relationship was fueled by his intentional time of prayer. And we've seen it time and time again, where Jesus took time out, took time off to go pray, quiet time with God. And so when the situation comes, the connection's there, the power's there. He's not leaning on his strength. He's leaning on God's spirit's strength, the power of God the Father, not his human muscular strength. In our case, we connect with God in prayer. We rely on God in prayer. And so what, what the disciples did in this situation, I think we do it all the time. We're the, we're, the, we're the disciples here. We try to tackle life in our own power. We figure, I've got this. After all, I'm only dealing with little things, right? So we, we struggle through. We try to pay the bills, get the kids to soccer, fix the house, work on our jobs. And when we come to the end of our strength, we just, we work more, we muddle along, we try to lift the load. But then the problems show up. Our health fails. Our child gets in a car crash. Our checkbook is overdrawn. Well then, maybe you're like me. And we simply try harder. And sometimes it's not until we've exhausted all of our resources and all of our energy and we finally turn to God. 
like we're sitting in the middle of the pile of parts that was once a rototiller. And we've made a mess out of everything. And then we consider asking for help. So my dad would have helped me. We could have done it together. All I needed to do was ask. And his strength, his wisdom, his ability it would have made the difference for the life of our rototiller. It would have made all the difference. I would, I would have been spared a whole lot of extra work, a whole lot of anxiety, a whole lot of frustration, and I would have enjoyed time with my dad. And instead, I tried to do it on my own. I tried to do it on my own. We were never made to tackle this life on our own. Instead, we live with God's presence. He is with us. And we can lean on his strength. We can serve in God's power. We weren't meant to do it alone. When Jesus launched his disciples and he returned to heaven, he left them with this amazing promise. Matthew 28, verse 20, he says, I am with you always. And he's about ready to leave, but he's saying, I'm actually still here. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. As long as you can think. And we can always rely on God's help because Jesus is here. He's with us today. He's with us tomorrow. He's with us forever. He has the power to tackle this life beyond our limitations, beyond our strength, beyond our emotions, beyond our anxieties and our cares. He's got the power to tackle this life. The Apostle Paul wrote this in Ephesians 3.20. He says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us. God is the creator of the universe and he's at work in us. He says to accomplish infinitely more than we could ask or think. So God's ready to do even more than you could ever even imagine. And he's greater than you can ever imagine. And he's actually work right side, right inside of you, right inside of me. See, I can't sustain a life of service alone. If I try to go it alone, I'm never going to see how much God can do. I'm only going to get to see how much Ron can't do. When I lean into God, I get to see his work. Jesus never intended us to go it alone. He's here and he's all we need. And his power is at work within us. The same power, the same power that raised Lazarus from the grave. The same power through which Jesus rose again. The same power is at work within us. We just need to ask Ask yourself this, am I trying to tackle life and service, helping other people in my own power, in my own strength? Or do I serve in God's power? Serve in God's power. Maybe you're wondering, if, if God's power is really at work within me, it's really there, then how do I tap into that? How do I rely on that? And ask yourself this question. Am I asking for God's strength? Am I asking for his help? Am I, am I asking for his power? 
Or am I stepping out in my own strength? See, prayer, prayer unlocks God's power. It's our chance to lean in and rely on God. It's our chance to share our struggles with him and ask for his help. It's, it's our chance to take it off our own shoulders and, and lean into God's arms. Peter, one of Jesus' closest friends, and he was there that day on the mountain, and he was there that day in the crowd, and he wrote this later on. He said, Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares for you. He cares for you. Share your worries in prayer. Ask for God's strength in prayer. Lean into your spiritual father in prayer. God is here for us. He's with us. And he will help us far beyond our strength, far beyond our ability, far beyond our resources, beyond our emotions. Just talk to God. In prayer, we get a chance to connect with God and share our struggles with God and rely on God. To rely on God's power, a first step is to begin to talk to him. Build a habit of prayer. Build it into your life. Build a habit of prayer. Start your day by talking to God. How do you wake up in the morning? Talk to God. Thank, thank him for his love. Maybe ask him for an opportunity to share his love with other people today. Ask him for opportunities to serve. Try to build that habit. Find a consistent time throughout your day that, that works in your schedule to build a relationship with God, to read his word, to, to think about the words that he's written to you in the Bible, and respond to him in prayer. Talk with him in prayer. Ask him what he would like you to do today for years, I, I build a habit of prayer each morning. And in my mindset, what I was trying to do was do the right thing. To consistently pray, pray, to consistently go to God. But I was going to tackle each day for God. And there was a key mindset there. I was and for God. It was really my strength. And gradually, God started to change my, my whole perspective. And God doesn't need me to work for him. He doesn't need me at all. God invites me to live life with him, in him, to get up each day and to serve not for him, but with him. God's right here. He's right with me. He's right there with you all of the time. And he's offering me the power that I need in each opportunity to live out his character, to live out his words, to live with him. He is with me and he is with you. So don't just build a habit of prayer. Build a lifestyle of prayer. A lifestyle that, that is aware of God and relies on God all, the, all throughout your day. Completely a reliance on him. Find times throughout the day where you can talk to God. And maybe build reminders in as you're getting started. Maybe, maybe something you passed in your house that just gives you a, I'm going to take a, a moment to, to talk to God, maybe a, a card in your car or a, a sign that, that talks about prayer and you remember, hey, I'm going to pray right now. Maybe a note on your fridge and, and just begin to talk to God all throughout your day and be, be thankful for the little things. Look for the little ways that God has showed up. Maybe it's you've been frantically looking for your key. Okay, me, when I'm frantically looking for my keys and 
and I find them. And to stop and say, thank you, God. It wasn't in my brain, and thank you for helping me find them. Or thank you for giving me a wife that helps me find my keys. Thank you, Lord. Look, look for the ways that you've seen God at work. Ways that you can serve others with his love. And talk about these throughout the day. Talk with God about these. Look for his strength and his, his endurance. Look for his character and his energy to, to help you to live out his love. Ask for God's help to serve. Talk to God all day. Lean on his strength all day. And serve other people asking for and looking for his help, expecting God to show up. Serve through divine effort. Not my effort. Not your effort. Serve, serve with God. His power is there for you. See, when we ask for God's help, we're turning from our own limitations, from our own power, and we're talking to the greatest power of the universe, the one who created us, the one who loves us and sent his son to die in our place, the one who wants to live with us forever. He wants us. And he created it all. He can certainly help us. There's no greater power to turn to than God. And when we invite God to work, we get to see his mission accomplished. Beyond our limitations, we get to see God step up. We're going we're gonna to experience the patience and the endurance and the power to overcome beyond what we could ever imagine that we were capable of. We'll see God at work. We'll see lives transformed when we serve through God's power. This morning, would you close your eyes with me? Would you just, would you just think about this? Would you think about what God has done for you with me? Sometimes I'm like the boy's father. When I say, I believe, God help my unbelief. Maybe you can relate to that this morning. See, the question of salvation is not, do you believe completely? Have you figured everything out? Have you answered every question? Have you gotten rid of every doubt? The question is, do you believe? Do you believe? Have you placed your faith and trust? Are you asking Jesus for his forgiveness? Are you willing to give him your doubts, your fears, your cares? If you've never done that, there's no better day than today to say, God, I believe. Help my unbelief. God, I'm trusting you for my salvation. Forgive me. I don't deserve you. I am not as perfect as you I have fallen short, but Jesus did it all for me. And I want to accept your love. I want to challenge you this morning to ask God, to ask for his forgiveness, to trust him. Dear God, there's someone here this morning that's one, that wants your forgiveness. Help them to ask right now. And if you're asking, tell someone in your connect group. Tell the friend that came with you this morning. Come to me or one of our team members here at Berean. We would love to celebrate with you and we'd love to share this experience with you. Dear Jesus, you love us. You said you're never going to leave us. You're never going to forsake us. That you're here with us. God, help us to lean into your power. You're greater than we could ever imagine. And you love us more than we could ever understand. Thank you for your power. Make us humble to ask. In Jesus' name, amen. 
This morning, we're going to introduce a new song. Because God is bigger sometimes than we could ever, we could ever imagine. His power is greater. And I just want to share some of the lyrics of this song this morning. It says, speak to me. It's a prayer from God to God. Speak to me when the silence steals my voice. You understand me. You understand me. Come to me in the valley of the unknowns. You understand me. Then it responds. So I throw my cares before you. My doubts and my fears, they don't scare you. You're bigger than I thought you were. You're bigger than I thought. Verse 2 says, I believe, but help my unbelief. You understand me. Help, help me reach the faith that's underneath. You understand me. And in the bridge, we get a chance to respond and say, I will rest in my Father's hands. I will rest in the Father's hands. And so this morning, as we respond to God's power, let's do this together. Let's pray to God together in song. Would you stand with me? And let's rest in the Father's hands.